encouraging because you knew what was coming and everybody still jumped on board and sang this song together. I don't want to go all the way back through it and I promise I will not try to sing any part of it on my own. But can I just read that third verse again? All three verses are great. The sentiment is wonderful. The chorus has that mountain climbing, going and getting the lamb idea, which is great. But verse three is just always stuck with me because of its beautiful variety. First of all, here's our phrase that we're using this week. Thus, I would go on missions of mercy, intentionality and purpose, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the faint, raising the fallen, pointing the lost to Jesus the way. Something that we rarely notice there, and for the first several times I didn't notice, is that it said, before it said cheering the faint and raising the fallen, it said following Jesus. I have this intense belief that for children of God, Jesus is going to lead you into circumstances and situations. And he's going to lead people into your life. Some of those people were once children of God and they've drifted away. And he's going to put them in your life and walk you right into the room. Some of them, and you'll hear tonight, will do kind of like a saints first and then non-saints application. In other words, he'll take people who've fallen away from the truth and he'll put you in a situation to try to help bring them back. But also there are those who are lost who have never known the truth, who are also struggling and confused. And he'll lead you into those paths as well. And God expects us to do that because, folks, that's the work. That's the work. The work is the people. I'm reminded of Ephesians chapter 2. We love Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Talk about how by grace you have been saved through faith not as a result of works that any man should boast. You've been saved by God. You've been saved by the offering of Jesus. But verse 10 says we've been saved to do what? To get to work. We've been saved and set aside so that we can go about carrying out God's good works. Assembling is a good work. Being a faithful Christian and a holy person is a good work. But more than that, God wants us, in addition to that, to be soul-seeking and searching. And so that's what we're talking about this week. We spent a little time yesterday or Sunday kind of working on that vessel idea, which I'll mention again at the end. And then as we got into last night's lesson, these two lessons kind of go together, what we did last night and what we're doing tonight. So let me give you just a brief kind of remembrance of what we did last evening. We were in Luke chapter 15, and we were dealing with those Pharisees. The Pharisees are very religious. They're very accomplished. They kind of get together and huddle together and they did their own thing and they began to feel elite. They were not the kind of people who would go to Zacchaeus' house. They would not spend time with tax collectors and sinners. And once you'd done them wrong, chances are you were out for good. But fortunately, Jesus was not like that. And in Luke 15, when he was addressing the pharisaical thinking, he said, let me tell you three stories. First time to touch, okay. Okay. Let me tell you three stories. He said, these three stories will help you understand. Here's what Jesus is saying. How I, Jesus the Christ, how I am different than the religious leaders around you. First of all, for me, just one soul is worth the effort. And I really want you to think about that. Just one soul. Sometimes when we think about evangelism or outreach or going after someone, it feels like it needs to be kind of grandiose or, or big or collective. It's never been the way that it works. Jesus said, I would leave the 99 and I would go after just one soul. And I told you last night and I still mean it. That's the most sobering story for me of the three. Because it revealed to me that I'm not as much like Jesus as I'd like to think that I am. I was not the kind of person who saw the value in going after the one, especially if they're going off again and again. I would just kind of take uh, pride in the 99 we still had. But how many of you know that in some churches, eventually the 99 becomes like 90? And then 75, and then 50, and then 30. And you wonder, well, well, what happened? Well, one at a time, they drifted, and Jesus said, I really think we should have been going and trying to re restore and redeem those. In the second story, we looked at the woman in the coin, and I made some suggestions from Linsky's commentary and a couple of others as well, that it's kind of representing the church, that the church has this kind of a bride with this necklace, and when you lose a piece of yourselves, you are less for God than you were. And I just think it would be a great attitude, whether that's the inclination of this text or not, it would be a great attitude to think that if anyone in this local church drifts away, that you are less than what you were for God and we want them back in order to be whole again. Now, I caveated that. I'm increasing my caveat skills. 
in that there are some who are divisive, who are dangerous, and who are leaven. And we know that that exists. And they're away from us on purpose and for a reason. But there are a great many others who are just confused and burdened and struggling and need our help. So maybe that's where shepherds can get involved and get the members involved and say, hey, let's go see if we can get that coin back again and we can present ourselves to the Lord like we were. And then, of course, lastly, this we know this one really well. The father, one of his two boys, leaves and then comes back, and I'm just enamored by the attitude of the father. He'd been disgraced in a way in their culture which was just about as serious an offense as you could commit, squandering all that he had saved up for his boy. And yet, the boy just walks on the property and the dad does the rest. He goes to him and embraces him. You guys remember the ring on his finger and the coat on his back and the fattened calf that's offered and all the things. The boy didn't have to pay it back. He didn't have to make it right. Just returning, kind of like repentance, just returning is all God wanted. And the father responded in that way. And I just hope that you're thankful every day that God does that, that we have a father like that. Maybe you sit in that story and you're thinking of somebody else. Well, I've been the prodigal myself, and it feels pretty amazing that God would accept me. I tell you what would really hurt me, though. It would really hurt me if God accepted me, but brethren wouldn't. It would really hurt me if all I wanted was to be at peace with the Lord, but somebody held a grudge, and somebody didn't like it, and somebody felt maligned, and that's what happened in that story. And, of course, it's the Pharisees painted in the form of the other brother. You remember the two mistakes the other brother made. You're going to hear it again before we're done tonight. One is he was concerned about himself first and foremost and pretty much the whole time. And two, he was comparing himself to the offenses of his brother, even emphasizing the prostitutes instead of comparing his mercy to the mercy of his father. It would have humbled him tremendously and changed everything. And as I did remember to say last night, so I don't need to say it again, but I'm already started, so I'm going to do it. What if the brother would have came back and his dad wouldn't have been home? And the person he would have encountered was his other brother. I wonder how that story would have gone. You know, if somebody tries to come back in your family or in this church or someone you know, God's here, but he's probably not going to come down and bear hug him, you know? He's going to expect you to do it. We're the ones. So love those stories, and they're really kind of gauged towards those Pharisees. Now, let's say you leave last night and you go, I'm ready. I, I want to go on missions of mercy. I'm going to climb a few hills. I would say that that's great that you want to do that, but let's spend a little bit of time letting Jesus show us how to do that. Because sometimes we can get very excited about restoring and redeeming and helping and going and do a bit more damage than good because there are a few things that need to be happening in order for it to work. So that puts us in Matthew 18. I'd love everybody to open their Bibles there. Matthew, the 18th chapter. There are four observations that I would like to make with you. They're all right there in the chapter. I hope that you can appreciate that when it came time for missions of mercy, we went straight into the Gospels and we've sat at the feet of Jesus. He taught us the parables and now he's going to teach us some attributes and attitudes. Here's something different though. Look in the first verse. At this time, the disciples came to Jesus and said... Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, this is different than our previous. In Luke 15, he's saying, don't be like those Pharisees. Love people like I love people. But this is not the Pharisees. These are the A-listers. These are the super Christians. These are the ones who come on a Tuesday night after a long day of work. Is it today Tuesday? I mean, these these are the disciples. They're the best of the best of the best. The problem is they spent most of their time arguing over who was really the best of the best of the best. If you don't think there's this natural inclination to elitism, I don't think you would never not think. We know that that's the way people are. When we get good at something and we kind of figure out the rules and we've kind of established ourselves as holy and different, there is this almost natural fleshly elevation that happens and you've got to intentionally fight that or it will lift us up. These guys were always arguing about who was the greatest. Two of them actually sent their mom in to say, hey, you know, uh, how about my boys on your left and on your right? And of course, what it meant to be on Jesus' left and Jesus' right was to die on a cross to get, they didn't even know what they were asking, and he had to kind of correct them. So Jesus says, all right, disciples, I have positioned you, I have taught you, I have expressed missions of mercy to you, I want you to go out and save people, but you must carry the right attributes with you. There are at least four of them, and here they are. And I want to show them to you tonight, and that's all we're going to do for the rest of the time. Let's read the first part together, and I think you'll see them naturally grow out of the text. 
I'll start in verse 1 and read down through just verse 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Okay, who is it? Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted, I'm reading from the New American Standard, 1995, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So simple first point, be humble. You know, sometimes when we think about conversion, being converted, we think out to in. We need to convert people from outside of Christ to inside of Christ. But are there any Christians tonight who need to be converted? You say, well, no, that doesn't make any sense. Converted is non-Christian to Christian. He's looking at followers of him, and he's saying, you know who might need to be converted just as much as the world? You guys might need to be converted. But it's not from outside of Christ to inside of Christ. It's from this estimation of yourself to this estimation of yourself. Turns out the disciples were the ones who needed to be converted from a place of prideful thinking to a place of humility. So how does he illustrate that? He says, bring me a child. We don't know much about this child. It could have been one of the street urchin or something or some poor or impoverished family or, or somebody you know, that they knew that was a disciple. But they bring the child and the child sits on his knee and he says, look at this child. And what would they see? They would see someone who is helpless, who is vulnerable, who was totally exposed to whatever Jesus decided to do with him. He had no protection, and he sat there vulnerably upon his knee. He said, until you are like this child, you cannot be great in the kingdom of heaven. So it is. The first most significant thing that every child of God needs is an incredible amount of humility. That's why I kind of finished last night by saying you feel kind of crummy, right? You're like, oh, I'm nowhere near where God wants me to be, and I'm nowhere near as great. It's just going to make you humble. It's a beautiful thing to understand your need and your insufficiency. There's this great song called In Need. Anybody heard the song In Need? I was talking to uh, Tyler, and they said they haven't gotten the slides for it yet. I'm going to send them a link to the slides. But In Need goes like this. In need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above. Now, I'm going to start it over because I want you to be sure that you understand that we're not talking about people out there. We're talking about you and me. If you've been to church 272 services in a row, like I mentioned the other day, I don't remember what number that I said, and you've read the Bible through every year since you were 15, that's great, but you're still in need. On your best day, under your best accomplishments, in your holiest form, you will never be any stronger or more worthy than a helpless street urchin kid sitting on Jesus' knee. And that establishment positions us to do great things. So listen to it and think of yourself. I am in need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of things that only you can give to me, in need of Christ, the perfect lamb, my refuge strong, the great I am. This is my song. Now listen, my humble plea, I am your child. I am in need. Go try it, superstar evangelists. Go try facing people who are in need, approaching as the person who is no longer in need. See how that works. Remember what I told you on Sunday? If you're having any conversation with anyone about their sin, about their life, about changes that they need to make, about their lowly position, if they even begin to perceive in any inclination in your speech that you're here and they're here, the conversation is over. You can keep talking if you want. You can show them how great that you are, and you can ask them why they're not more like you, but there is no influence from a place of pride. The Lord can do nothing with pride. That's why he opposes it. But he gives grace to the humble, and he employs and uses humble people. We need to get low in our self-estimation. We're unworthy sinners saved by the blood of Jesus. 
And that's the message that we take to our friends and family. We're unworthy, you're unworthy, none of us are worthy. But the Lord saved me and I want to come down here with you and help to lift you up, not pull you up. You better be lifting, not pulling. We don't pull people up to where we are. We lift them like God lifted us. Let me show you an example. Go to 1 Timothy 2 for a moment. 1 Timothy in chapter, let's do 1 Timothy chapter 1. Maybe we read this in our first session on Sunday morning, but just listen to the Apostle Paul. I would think Apostle Paul, like he's the super Christian for me. I can't think of anybody who seemed stronger or did better or had more worthiness in his life than the Apostle Paul. Here is how he thought of himself. Verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, he says. Verse 12, 1 Timothy 1. Who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Let me tell you about me. I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with faith and love, verse 14, which are found in Christ Jesus. Then he says this. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom you are... For no. He said, among whom I am the foremost of all. You know the guy who shouldn't be in? It's me. And his point is very simple. For this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now, not to me, not to us, but to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You think Paul was successful with that approach to his ministry? I'm in need, I'm unworthy, God save me. If God can save me, he can save you. That's a spirit of humility that lifts people up. I had to learn this in ways, and tonight as we go through these four things, I want to apply it a little bit to people who've fallen from the church, as I said, and then also people who, who are out in the world. But I just have to tell you a quick story about how I learned about humility in this way. Uh, there's a, a family member of ours, a young man who was a Christian for several years, done some preaching, and he fell away from the truth. He left the Lord, he left the church, and it hurt. It hurt me very badly. I hurt for my kids and for my wife and for my family, and I became very angry. Do you become angry when someone does that? I was very, very angry, but I also became bitter, and I kind of became a mean person. Like, I wouldn't talk to him, I wouldn't reach out to him, I wouldn't call him. When I would see him at holidays, I would sit on the other side of the room with a scowl on my face. I didn't want to have a scowl, I'm not a scowly person. But I was just so disappointed in him that I almost couldn't even, as we say. But what I started to notice was, what it starts to look like is, I'm here and he's here, I can't even talk to you. I can't even be kind to you. You have fallen so far. And something occurred to me that changed, I think, both of our lives. One day, I just asked myself this question out of the blue. I hadn't seen him in a year. And he was still out in the world. And I asked myself this question. I thought, if he ever wanted to return to Jesus, what are the chances he would call me? What do you guys think the chances would be? Pretty much zero. And I realized that I didn't approach him as someone who needed Jesus like him, to lift him up from a place of understanding. And I was not someone who was approachable. And so I called him up and said, would you like to go do lunch? And he agreed. And we met halfway and we did lunch together and I made a commitment going into that lunch that I was not gonna rehash the fact that I disagree with what you're doing. He already knew I disagreed with what he was doing. We'd established all that a lot. So I said, here's what I'm gonna do. I sat down at dinner and I said, look, I am just here to apologize to you. I'm sorry for my attitude. I'm sorry for the scowls for the last two Thanksgiving dinners. I am sorry for the way that I have been. And do you guys think that was easy or hard? Really hard. Why? Because right, wrong. Christian, non-Christian. Still doing the stuff, no longer doing the stuff. But that wasn't the point. The point was my heart and my behavior. So I apologize. When I got done, he looked at me, and I was waiting. I was, my heart was beating out of my chest, and he twisted the knife on me. He was like, you know what? You have been a jerk, and my wife doesn't want anything to do with you. Like he was, and I was going, I was like, what did I want to do? I wanted to go, wait a minute. 
don't, I still go to church. Like, this is about you. But it wasn't about him. And I took it, and, I t- and it, it was re- it's one of the hardest conversations that I've been in. But you know what? A couple of years later, he came back to the Lord. And guess who he called? I'm really proud of that. You know, he needed to change. There's, we knew that. We knew that he needed to change. He needed to change, but I was the one who needed to be converted. Maybe our conversion can lead to theirs. Attitude, approach, humility, and understanding that even on our best day, we both need Jesus the exact same amount. Let me show you a couple other things here. Go back to our text. There are four here. I wanted to spend most of the time on this first one. It means a lot to me because it's, it's really consistent with everything that we've seen. But go back with me to the text now in Matthew chapter 18. I want to read a few more verses. And of course, the, that point can apply to people who've never been Christians. Same kind of thing. Most of the people the disciples interacted with were not yet Christians. And Paul met were not yet Christians. And his humility went a long way. Here's a second thought in verse 5. Pick up with me in verses 5 through 11. He said this. Okay, if you're going to be great in the kingdom, you need to be humble. He said, and, and he kind of changes the child imagery a little bit. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes he says if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble cut it off and throw it from you it is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands and two feet cast into the eternal fire if your eye causes you to stumble pluck it out and throw it from you it is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and to be cast into the fiery hell for two more verses See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. And then verse 11. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Which is kind of like our theme for the week. Now, let me tell you the point right now, and then we'll get into it a little bit. He says, be careful. Be careful when you are interacting with spiritually vulnerable people with people who are not grounded in the truth, who do not fully understand the truth, be careful how you interact with them, and you do whatever you need to do not to make them stumble. Like, I remembered this text from the lust passage. Isn't it in the Sermon on the Mount where he says, you pluck out an eye or cut off a hand. You do whatever you need to do to make sure you don't live in lust. He did say that. But he brought that language out again when he was talking about causing an impressionable one to stumble. Folks, we need to take very seriously how carefully we interact with people who are spiritually vulnerable. And I'm going to kind of give that two categories. First of all, he says the little ones who believe in me. And he could very well be talking about immature new Christians or people who are really struggling with basic elements like Hebrews 6 of the faith. And they may go or they may stay. They may grow or they may fall away. Be careful. Be careful, super Christians. I'll quit using that term because you know that's like a fictitious term. But like super developed Christians, be careful. And then verse 11, though, he says, I actually want to save everybody. So I think it broadens out to this idea to whoever the Lord puts in your life who is vulnerable, impressionable, unsure, teetering, be very, very careful how you approach them. I've kind of imagined it this way that, that, A sheep has gotten away. We're going to read that again in this text. One of Jesus' sheep has gotten away. Maybe it was a disciple that is now wandering. Maybe it's someone who grew up and and just fell into sin. But Jesus is, is, is chasing down that sheep. And there's a chasm right here. And the sheep is almost over the edge. And Jesus is about to grab. What's he going to do when he gets that sheep? He's going to grab that sheep. He's going to put the sheep on his shoulders. He's going to carry that sheep back home. But just before he can grab that sheep, I start running up. I'm another sheep. I'm a very rambunctious sheep. And I'm going to help Jesus out. So I come running up full speed, ready to help this situation. And I run up there in all fours, and I bump that sheep, and I knock him off. And then I take off running, just before Jesus can get his hands on him. Something tells me that my ambition, holy ambition, is going to get two sheep in the chasm that day. You know what I'm saying? We need to be mindful, humble, careful, loving, merciful, patient, 2 Timothy 2, 
gentle, even when opposed, to try to help win people. You say, well, sometimes Jesus was pretty rough. Well, Jesus was a heart reader, and he was dealing with very hard-hearted Pharisees. That's not exactly what we're talking about here. We're talking about impressionable people. I'll give you a couple of examples that have to do with with church, you know, with people who come in the door at church. Uh, I was worshiping somewhere in the Houston area. I was preaching there, and there was a family that had really been wandering. I mean, they were, they were not doing great. And several of us had made an effort to get them to come back, and finally one Sunday morning they come back, and they're standing in the foyer, and several of us are greeting them and telling them how great it is to see them. You know, it's such a big deal that they're there. And, and up walks this, this family at church. Now, I'm not going to say, like, do you know this family? I'm not going to do that with you. But this is the family church that was always there. They never miss a service for any reason. They're always there. They're all in. They're, they're great. They really were great. But they were not particularly merciful. So I, I watched. I kind of I said hi to the guy. I was like, oh, it's so good to see you. you know, and I kind of step off, and I see her pass me by, and I look over there, and I'm like, it's like all happening in slow motion. And she goes over to him, and she's like, been missing you around here, and walks off. That hurts so bad. And I kind of ran up and I'm like, hey, you know, it's me again, smiling guy. It's good to see you again. And he looks at me and he goes, who was that? Who was that? She's been going to, they've been going to church there for 25 years. What should they have done? Any guesses? What they should have done is the both of them who live very close to the building should have walked over to him and said, we are so glad you are here. Thank you for coming today. Would you like to come over for lunch? We'd love to have you over. Like actually wanting to be careful and mindful with them, and that's what we need. I talked to you last night about people inviting people to church and inviting people back, and we're going to talk more about inviting people to church in a minute. And what if they come? Now, I know we don't want to. We talked at dinner about swarming them, and there needs to be maybe an organized effort. But to some degree, everybody has to show that this is like the father celebrating the son. Uh, another thing I mentioned to you guys about the, the Triumph Village, some of the, the rehab guys that we're working with back home, and them and some others from our community, when we started inviting everybody and telling everybody they're welcome to come visit and all this kind of stuff, we had, people, we had a guy show up with, with tattoos on his face that like, he got practiced on by guys who were not professionals when he was in his 20s. It is not terrific. And we had the tattoo guy come in, and we had the guy with shorts come in, and we had, and he saw everybody with pants, and he came back the next week still in shorts. Like, I don't know what we're going to do with them. Not in modest shorts, but shorts. We had, the, we had some Yeti cup people. You guys know the, them? The Yeti cup. Maybe there's coffee in it. I don't know if there's coffee in it or not. We had a bunch of them start coming, and they would sit in the back row, and we finally had a baptism on a Sunday. A lot of those guys were baptizing on, like, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we had a baptism on a Sunday, and this is East Texas, Okay. And he comes up out of the water, and the back two rows erupt. Like, these, these two things struck each other, and sound came out. And I don't even know, I don't know what you think about that. I don't know what Mr. John thinks about it. It's not about what you think about that. It's not about where you think this is okay or not okay. The point is, there were people very uncomfortable with all of that. And my thing is, like, maybe you're right to be uncomfortable with all that. But what are your options? One option, let's get them out of here. You know, people come to your church, it's like fish jumping in the boat. You guys know that? It's like a fish just jumped into the boat. But sometimes we're like four-year-old girls, and we get over on the other side of the boat and go, ooh, Dad, get the fish out of the boat. <laughs> These are people of the world. They're not like us. That's the point. We need to be careful and kind. And you know what? I'll just tell you on the clapping thing. Like, we settled most of the clapping thing down. It's kind of a cultural thing there. A lot of people are uncomfortable with it. But not until about six meals, three or four home studies, we knew everything about all these guys and their stories. We loved each other. And then we were like, hey, we got a few people who aren't really cool with that. And they're like, no problem, brother. I just want to be a help. They ended up being very humble, which is kind of a really cool thing that happens with new converts. They come in with a lot of humility. So we could apply this to any number of things, but I think it's helpful tonight to think about like your building and people who come back and people who visit because we need to be super duper careful because I haven't used super strong language this week, but the strongest language we've heard all week is Jesus saying, look at me. If I lose one of these that I was going to get because of your behavior, he said, I gotta be honest with you, it would be better for somebody to tie a stone around your neck and drown you in the ocean than to face me. Now, 
have a very, um, I don't know, I have a personality that pursues darkness sometimes. So I've kind of played that out in the judgment. Here's what it looks like to me. I'm standing there ready to go in. I'm, I mean, I'm a preacher. Like, is that, is that a list? I mean, I preach, you know, go to church a lot. I got a great tie on. Like, I'm trying to serve God, and I'm ready, and I'm ready. And I was baptized for the remission of my sins, and I worship in what I believe to be an authorized way, and I read uh, a New Testament chapter every single day. And I'm gonna get up there, and I'm gonna go, let's go. What I, what I hope I'm really gonna be doing is crawling up there, seeing if he'll let me grab his foot, honestly. But let's say I'm walking up there. I hope I'm not. Walking up there going, let's go, and he's looking at me going, there are so many reasons I wanted to let you in, Chris. There was so much promise in you, but would you look over there across that chasm a moment? Because there are four or five people standing there on the edge that I put into your life because I knew you could help me save them, but because of you, they're over there. And that's where you're going to. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going out like that. You with me? I'm not going out like that. That is not the way this is going to happen in a way that misses that. And you know what? If you want a little bit more, you're like, I don't want any more. Don't talk any more about this. But if you want a little bit more, let's finish with some Matthew 25 tomorrow night. Can we finish with that a little bit tomorrow night? Well, here's a third thought. <laughs> Go to Matthew chapter 18. Third thing here. I, I can see that especially if maybe you're not, you know, developed long-term in the faith or really comfortable with scriptures or a preacher or whatever, that you might look at this and say, you know what, I just don't think I'm going to do it. I don't think I'm going to be the one to go. I'm not going to make the call. I'm not going to do it. But the, the problem is that God expects all of his people to be engaged in soul seeking. I mean, you can't create a, a church culture that's seeking souls unless all of the membership is growing towards the seeking of souls. I mean, I think churches have learned that you can't, like, hire out great evangelism. You know, you just hire a preacher and he does all that. I mean, we're running out of the preachers, so it's not going to work long anyway. It's got to become something more. And so in the text, in verse 12, he tells this familiar story. He says, what do you think? If any man has 100 sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99? I mean... Matthew 18, 12, and on the mountains and go and search for the one that is straying. If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than, that was our point from Luke 15, more than even the 99 which had not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one, that even one of these little ones perish. So here's what we're going to do. What do we do about that? You say, I feel that. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to be useful. If your brother sins, go. I don't even need to read the rest of this. Not talk about them. Not go, that was a lot of work. Go. If your brother sins, go. Show him his fault. Do so in private. If he listens to you, you won your brother, which, by the way, makes heaven rejoice more than 100 songs that we sing. He says, look, if he won't listen to you, then you go find two or three more people, probably people who know him and love him. Relationships are important. So that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. He is wrong and he needs to change. It goes on to say, if he refuses to listen to them, then you tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then you let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. But whose choice was that? We talked about this yesterday. That's his choice. After being loved, gone to, cared for, appealed to, making sure we got the facts straight, with the goal to win. If he doesn't want to come to Christ, that is his decision. But I just want it to be their decision, not our behavior. And we have to go. You know, if I, um, if I had said early in the, before you, let's say you didn't know what I was going to preach about tonight, because you might know that Galatians 6 is in my pocket over here, and I'm about to pull it out. But you don't know that. And you come to church tonight, and I say, hey, really quick, everyone, we got any spiritual people here tonight? Anybody spiritual? And you might be like, that's weird language. It's not. It's Bible language. Are you spiritual? Are you in the spirit? Do you love the Holy Spirit? Are you spiritual? Then I think I could convince everyone to go, yes, I'm spiritual. All right? Are you spiritual? You can give me a little nod if you're spiritual. It's not going to get strange. It's just spiritual. Go to Galatians 6. Galatians 6 has this really pressing concept to it that says, those who are spiritual, I have not yet taken you to heaven because I've got something really important for you to do. In Galatians chapter 6, brethren... Even if anyone is caught in a trespass, any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. So it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. 
in a spirit of gentleness. That was my mistake with the family member. Gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. You know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of Jesus going out to the sheep and picking them up and carrying him back. Like I told you, if I even went out after that sheep, I'd probably do some kicking and say, hey, I came all the way out here to get you. Now you're going to walk all the way back. How about you bear his burdens? You say, how do I lighten? You want to talk about humility? Go to someone you know who's caught in sin and say, how do I help you lighten this load? I can see that you're hurting. I can see that something's going on. I am not here to tell you to be more like me. I am here to help you. How can I help? He said everyone who is spiritual should be doing those things, bearing one another's burdens. And just to add that kind of saints first concept, go to verse 10. While we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of faith. So whether it's retrieving someone who's drifted, let's go. Or if it's someone who's not even yet a Christian in the world, are we waiting? I gave you the the wall illustration the other day about, you know, we're going to stay in here and wait for them to find us. Like, we need to go and get them. Now, I'm going to add a little something to this. I don't know how much time I, you guys don't care, right? Not enough people went no on that. Okay, here we go. (laughs) Not enough people. I want to talk about evangelism. I've talked about church a little bit, people coming back. I want to talk a little bit about evangelism. I think that preachers over the years, twice a year, get up and preach a sermon on event. In my history, you know, my life, even as a preacher, we get up and preach twice a year. Hey, we all need to be more evangelistic. You need to go spread the gospel. And we make everybody feel about this tall, and then we just all go home. And we feel really crummy about ourselves until six months later when we forget that we were supposed to be evangelistic, and the preacher reminds us, and we don't do it again, and we feel crummy again. What, what's the deal, preachers, myself included? You know what we need to teach our membership to do? We need to teach them how to be evangelistic. We need to teach them how to go, how to go one-on-one. Let me give you a quick indication. Uh, I didn't even bring, I did, I brought this. Okay, so at home we have a four-lesson book called The Gospel Message. I think it's a really easy way to teach the gospel to somebody. It's based off some old stuff I found somewhere and I've been working on it a long time. I think it's pretty user-friendly. So as a preacher, I use this. I go, hey, let's study this and let's do it and, and we do it together. But what we did, the first year I got to Linda, I've been there seven years. The first year we spent three months and every adult in the, in the church was given one with their name on it to fill out for themselves. And then three years later, when I started the fourth year, we went all the way through it again. And then this year, in the seventh year, guess what? We went all the way through it again. The principle isn't, hey, go be evangelistic. It's like, we can do this. We actually literally can do it. I can tell you that of the last, I think I just roughed it in my head, the last 25, a lot of it's the guys from the mission, but the last 25 baptisms, I think I've conducted two of those studies. Boy, you're a bad preacher. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not. Maybe I understand that the actual purpose is to empower members to take their spirituality and give it to someone and help them. So we have these stacked in our foyer. We have free New American Standard Bibles stacked in our foyer. We have five stacks of cards, and we challenge every member to hand out five every single month. I mean, five a month. That's five peppermint lattes. And you just, five a month that you hand out. And what we're trying to build is a culture that says, let's all be useful. That's a culture of evangelism, not a church with a couple of great evangelists. I want you to know, I know that we shortcutted that. You can do this. And you know what? You're going to be more powerful at it than the hired gun. It's important. All right, hey, wanted to give you that idea, and I can talk to Tyler more about that later. But what I'm saying is it's worth, I know it's not easy, and it's a little scary, But as I mentioned to you on Sunday, I mean, if you're saved, I guess you should already be in heaven. Why are you still here? If you're saved, just go. God says, actually, I think I've got a few souls that I need you to meet. How many of you know that's the lone main reason? There's one of two reasons you're still alive tonight. You ready? You need to repent or somebody that God loves in your life needs to repent. That's what we're still doing here. And I'm wearing my Astros tie. I could talk about them for the next 20 minutes. It's not why I'm here. It's not it. Souls. Now, the last one won't take very long to do, even though it's the longest portion, but you know it pretty well. Look back at the idea of being merciful. When we go back to Matthew chapter 18, he tells the story that we know well about the man who owes, you know, the math gets done differently, but he finishes the chapter. This guy may owe like $7 billion or something. It depends on how you figure it. In other words, it's, it's an astronomical, unbelievable number. And the, the king wants to settle the accounts, and the slave comes, and he begs. 
verse 25, after he said that he has to be sold and his wife has to be sold and his children have to be sold, he falls to his face, prostrate before the king, verse 26, and says, please have patience with me. I will repay you everything. He will never repay him everything. But he has a heart that just is penitent. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion. That's a very common Bible word in the life of Jesus. He felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Now, you know, I don't have to decode this for you. That's what happened when you became a Christian. When you became a Christian, you were forgiven an insurmountable amount of debt against you that you could do nothing with. They gave you a shovel. You just kept on digging until Jesus lifted you out. That's the story. But that slave went and he found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. That's a percent of a percent. Nothing compared. And he seized him and he began to choke him saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground. The slave pleads with him saying, have patience with me. I'll repay you. But he was unwilling. And he went and threw him in prison. You know the rest of the story. The other slaves went and told on him. They said, King, you're not going to believe this. You forgave him $7 billion, and he just wrestled a guy to the ground over 200 bucks. And he said, bring him back. He said, because you could not show even a measure of the mercy that I have shown to you, I'm going to throw you in prison until you pay back every cent, which means what? Eternal damnation. It's an unpayable amount. And so Jesus' last thing is something that is important to me. It's important in the song that we sing, and I wanted to finish with it, the idea of being merciful towards others. Go to 2 Timothy. We'll finish there, I promise. Last thing we're going to do, 2 Timothy. I just want to read again what we started on Sunday, and then we'll finish this thing up. Be merciful. The man in our story, by the way, who strangled his buddy, made the same two mistakes as the prodigal son's brother. And what I'm telling you is, if we want to be less like Pharisees and we want to be more like Jesus, we need to not make these two mistakes. Mistake number one, who was the only person he cared about? He only cared about himself. What can God give me? What can other people give me? Because he was ultimately focused on himself, God took away what he gave him because he thought it was all about himself. It can't be about you and be about Jesus. Cannot be. It has to be about others, and then Jesus flourishes. And the second mistake is he was comparing himself to this slave when he should have been comparing himself to the king. If he had looked at the king and the mercy that he had shown, it would have humbled him so far that to give a gift to his fellow servant would have been natural and obvious. But he was comparing himself, no debt, to his brother, some debt, and he did this. This is what cost him. This is going to cost you every time. When you go like this, it's over. He should have been comparing himself to the Lord. So I would encourage you to always do that every day. I am in need. I'm in need of grace. I'm in need of peace. I'm in need of things that only God can give to me. And I need to live that way. And the gratitude of it will change the way I interact with every single person in my life. There's nothing you can do to me that God has not already forgiven me of doing to him. Many times over. Humility is the answer. We'll finish with this. You guys have been great tonight. We've got one more night of study, and uh, it probably will go well. I'm putting two sermons together. That should be short. That should go great. Two sermons together. We'll see how that goes. I just want to finish with this. Let me just read it to you. Verses 20 through 26. If you guys weren't here on Sunday, this is a very important passage about you are something important for God. God wants some really special qualities inside of you at all times so that he can accomplish something super duper important. Let's read it. Now, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, there are also vessels of wood and earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the wickedness of verse 19, these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. That's what we are, vessels prepared by the Lord for every good work. What's that supposed to look like? I'll tell you this, it's not going to have youthful lusts in it, but it will have righteousness and faith and love and peace with those Fellow brethren who call on the name of the Lord with a pure heart, it's not going to have foolishness or ignorant speculations in it, I can tell you that, because it's not going to have quarrels. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome. Here's what we will be. We'll be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Now, here's the goal. Are you ready? Here's the goal. Not to win, not to be right, not to be better. The goal is that perhaps God may grant them repentance 
leading to the knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. I'm very naive. My wife tells me all the time I'm the most naive person she's ever met. I think everybody's good and everything's fine. I don't think there are very many bad people in the world. I know there are some bad people in the world. I think there are a lot of trapped, confused, misled, abused people who are broken all over this world. My goal and your goal is to find the ones God puts in front of us and help them come free of the snare of the devil that has seized their heart. You are a vessel made and then remade by God to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can pour out the qualities of the Spirit into the lives of every single person you meet and know in the name of the Lord Jesus. You ready for that? I'm I'm ready. It's hard and I like it because it's what we're here to do. If you're ready for that and you want some encouragement to do that, or if you're not yet a Christian, verses 19 and 20 said you need to be cleansed so that you can be useful. Christ will cleanse you of all of the debt, no matter how much. He'll cleanse you because he is is merciful. Praise God he is. Let's praise God that he is as we stand together and sing.